What's up, everybody? My name is Adam McDormand, and this is American Literature. Uh, this week, we're going to be taking a look at yet another text by Washington Irving called The Devil and Tom Walker. Now, as always, the best way for us to get the most out of this text is going to be for us to know a little bit about the author himself, to have some sense of the historical context surrounding our reading, to look at a few key literary features of this text, and as always, we'll finish by framing a few big ideas through which to view this text. Now, we've already been introduced to Washington Irving, who lived from 1783 to 1859. He was born into a merchant family in Manhattan, so he comes from a family of means with access to resources. Uh, he was born the same week that New York found out that the American Revolution had come to an end, and that's part of the reason why he ends up being named after General George Washington, who was an important figure in the American Revolution. Now, in my last video, we talked about how after the War of 1812, the Irving family business was in really bad shape. Uh, what we didn't cover in that last video, which is going to be very relevant to what we're looking at this week, is that in spite of the fact that a lot of these merchant families were negatively affected by the events of the war, shortly after that, the first industrial revolution kicks off in America. And as a result, America begins to become a major economic power in the world. And for the first time ever, manufactured items were widely available and people actually had the money to buy those goods. And this is a concept that is so foundational to what America is, for better or worse, that it sounds almost silly or even trivial to mention it. But keep in mind that prior to this moment in history, prior to the Industrial Revolution, uh, that simply wasn't a thing. And this will forever change the culture of America in several very good ways, but also in some, some very bad ways. So America's a very young nation at this point. We're expanding to the West actually quite rapidly. The Industrial Revolution is resulting in massive economic growth. And in general, people are very optimistic. All of that serves as really fertile ground for the growth of a new literary movement, Romanticism. Now, right off the bat, I want to clarify this term. And when we think about romantic, we often think about the concept of love. We think about candlelit dinners over plates of spaghetti and long walks on the beach and other such nonsense. Now, when we're talking about literary romanticism, that's something very, very different. I want you to make sure that you separate those two terms in your mind. They are different things. American literary romanticism, in large part, is a reaction against the literary tradition of the Enlightenment period and the Industrial Revolution. And we can more or less sum up this entire literary movement with four major characteristics. Individualism. Romantic individualism regards the rights and freedoms of the individual as superior or more important than that of the masses or the community. In some ways, this would be inevitable, if you think about it, after a colony grows into phase three and goes on to become an independent nation. It would obviously be less important to rely on a tight-knit community in pursuit of some kind of common good. It's also important to note here that the heroes of this literary period are not the elite, the wealthy, the educated people, but rather the common man. You can almost picture this as the rugged pioneer out on his own. That's individualism in a nutshell. And then we have imagination. The Romantics considered imagination to be of primary importance in literary creation. And again, this is a reaction to the previous emphasis on reason and logic as the most important thing that a person can have 
in writing. Think back to previous videos where we talked about these phases of colonization, and I described the literature of phase two in particular as something very pragmatic. It always served a purpose, often to help bind a community together so that they could actually survive long enough to become permanent. I just don't think we'd get a story like Rip Van Winkle or The Devil and Tom Walker that you're going to read this week if you're relying only on reason and you keep the imagination of the author sort of tucked away. These are stories that are deeply imaginative. And this also served as a very necessary form of escapism as industrialization brought more and more people into these densely populated city centers where they would find their jobs. That ties into the next characteristic, nature. Romantics had a very elevated view of nature. They saw it as a source of truth and beauty. It often played a very important literal role in the stories of the time. Again, being a very necessary form of escapism for people who were in these city areas. Nature becomes a source of beauty and mystery and perhaps something otherworldly or maybe spiritual, which again ties into the fourth characteristic the distant. Romantics were fascinated by faraway places and times. The curiosity about what's out there on the horizon only takes place because we've moved past phase two, well into phase three, and have become a nation. Remember our rugged individual, the pioneer, who's out there on his own. Where is he? He's escaping the city and heading out into the vast unknown reaches of the frontier. As you're reading this text, and really most of the rest of the text that we'll read this semester, I want you to be looking for ways that these four characteristics are displayed by the things that we're reading. You might even consider using some of these characteristics as a way to analyze the text for your active reading guide. So let's take a look at a few features of The Devil and Tom Walker itself. Much like Rip Van Winkle, this is a work of short fiction or a short story that could fall into one of a few different uh, literary genres. It could be called folklore, fairy tale, a tall tale, perhaps even a legend. And if you're confused as to what each of those genres mean and what makes them distinct from one another, please make sure to go back and review the Rip Van Winkle video that I put out last week because that goes over the characteristics of these genres. What I really want to focus on here is the way that this story borrows from a classic German legend called Faust. Now, Faust is the story of a man who meets the devil at a crossroads and makes a deal with him. Right? The, the deal is that Faust will be granted knowledge and worldly pleasures, but in return, when he dies, the devil gets his soul. He takes him to hell automatically. Sounds terrifying, doesn't it? Uh, this legend has been reimagined in stories throughout literary history, from the British playwright Christopher Marlowe to the legendary Delta blues musician Robert Johnson, who supposedly actually made that same deal in real life in order to master his craft sometime in the 1930s. At its heart, this is a story about a man who confronts the devil and has an opportunity to make a deal in return for his own soul. Now, one other literary feature of this text that we have to address is its depiction of the devil. Now, when you read this story, it won't take you long to get to this part, but the devil is described as a black man. Now, when I first started teaching this text, I read that description as something very literal. It wasn't a person, it was the devil and literally the color black. But we can't leave it there. I can't simply leave it at that because that ignores something that is perhaps deeply embedded in the American literary tradition. And that is the depiction of blackness as something that is inherently evil. It's interesting to consider the fact that many of the American romantic authors were very much opposed to slavery, but something about the uh, perception of blackness as inherently, at its core, twisted and broken and evil is something that is so much embedded in the culture of the time that even 
the artists and writers who were opposed to slavery could not help but to view black people as lesser than. In fact, they didn't really view them as people at all. So to even say that is, is to not fully capture the, the injustice, the wrong that was done here. And so we can't approach this text and not address that fact, uh, lest we whitewash some part of our literary and historical tradition that has to be called out, acknowledged, and identified as wrong in order to separate that from what's interesting, helpful, fascinating, or in enjoyable about this text. We have to say, okay, this part we know is a product of its time and, and deeply wrong. Racism existed then, it continues to exist now, and to not acknowledge, I think it puts us in danger of, of repeating those mistakes. And that leads nicely into the big ideas that this story touches on. The first one that I want to take a look at is what is the primary conflict of this story, and how does it resolve? I'm going to assume that you have studied conflict in previous English classes. So I'll ask you, is this conflict an internal one, where Tom Walker is struggling with his own ideas? Or is it some kind of external conflict between Tom and another character, perhaps the devil mentioned in the title of the story. Certainly that title gives us a bit of a clue as to what the conflict might be. However, there may be more here than meets the eye, and I want you to make sure that you're looking for what the true conflict of this story actually is and how it resolves at the end of this story. Next, I want you to think about what this story has to say about greed and materialism. And certainly that comes in part from the historical context of the time. I mean, perhaps the waves of industrialization that continue to take place in America during this time allow those who already have great wealth to build more efficient ways to capitalize or monetize the output of their workers. I often hear my students say that we really do need these ultra-wealthy people to create jobs for us simple folk. And to me, that sounds like the language of uh, people who have forgotten that workers are the ones that create value. Even the most talented supervisors and middle managers and CEOs are not creating value. In the best case scenario, they're simply empowering frontline workers to manufacture the best products with the fewest defects at the cheapest price, or to provide the highest quality customer service with the maximum amount of customer satisfaction. Do we see the greed and materialism of this time through the lens of this story echoed out to our present time, here and now in America? And then much like last week, when we talked about the way that fairy tales, legends, and folklore often contain a moral warning for the reader, what might that warning be? Is Washington Irving giving us an explicit warning against something? What is our takeaway? And of course, we'll get together and talk about that very soon. That's going to do it for this video, guys. Until next time, good luck, have fun, what a time to be alive.